brothers and sisters coming from throughout the African continent. Thank you for joining us. Um, the next session is going to look at governance and empowerment with a particular focus on the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. And no one can do this job better than um, Mr. Emmanuel Bencher Jr., who is from Accra, Ghana. And Mr. Emmanuel is the executive director of the CFTA Policy Network. He has worked with ECOWAS, the AU Pol he's also an AU policy analyst. He has worked with uh, ECOWAS, OECD, the Sahel West Africa. He's been a member of the Agenda 2063 Media Network. Mr. Emmanuel has an MA um, that looked at how ECOWAS and AU managed the West African conflict from 2011 to 2017. He has 15 years work experience in civil society and he's a friend of the APRM. He knows the CFTA in out. He's been interacting with colleagues in Ghana at the Secretariat. I think his lecture comes timely for colleagues who really don't know what the CFTA is. We've been hearing that the continent has opened up for free trade, but what is it? How can young people in Zimbabwe Harare start trading with colleagues um, in Cairo, Egypt? Small businesses, how do they make sure that their business thrive? So I'm going to ask Mr. Emmanuel to come in and really break down the CFTA to us, but with a particular focus on how young businesses can be empowered. So Mr. Emmanuel, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Good morning. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Lennon. Thank you for the opportunity. And I, kind correction, I'm, I'm the deputy. I'm not the executive director, deputy executive director. Thank you very much. And thank you for the opportunity once again. Um, it's, it's great to be speaking on a youth uh, platform. Uh, this made in addition, I, 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 first of all, I think you guys have done a great job. Uh, it's not easy putting things like these together. So kudos once again, and very happy that, to see that it's an APRM product. Um, uh, I, I, excuse, I, me, excuse me, Mr. Emmanuel, could you kindly switch on your video if you're able to, please? Uh, the network is not so great. That's why I switched off the, um, if, if my, my video. Brother, I apologize <laughs> for interrupting you. Please go ahead. No, no problem. No problem. Okay, so, so basically I'm going to try and address this as candidly and as uh, directly as possible. Um, use participation and leadership in political, civic, and economic developments at all levels. I, I think basically I could spend um, the whole day talking about that one. So I'm going to break it down to youth participation and leadership. And then I will be referencing political, um, civic economic developments. But let me just first of all say that um, I think one of the most important things for young people to appreciate, for the youth to understand about the African continental free trade area is that right now, Africa is on the right side of history. You may recall that about two, three years ago, the AU theme was the, um, had something to do with the youth dividend, um, the demographic dividend. That demographic dividend still exists. Youth represents about 60% of the continent's population, which means youth is a positive dynamic and positive catalyst for engagement of everything, including the African continental free trade area. The good thing about the African continental free trade area is that we have our regional spaces already. So the, there's an opportunity to build on what you have been doing at the regional level and scale it up to the continental level with the African continental free trade area. Now, all this is under the umbrella of the, of, uh, the Africa we want or the agenda 2063. One of the biggest things that we need to understand, whether you are youth or otherwise, is that the African continental free trade area is a flagship program of Agenda 2063. Agenda 2063 has about 14 flagship programs. Uh, there's a passport, there's free, freedom of movement and all these other things. And AFCFTA is just but one of them. But the AFCFTA is a process. It's important to also understand that even as there's an after secretariat here in Accra, the process 
it doesn't end there because at the end of the day, after all is said and done and member states adhere to protocols and they do the necessary with their ministries and so on and so forth, we're going to see an African continental customs union and then finally an African continental market, okay? All of these provide opportunities for young people. Uh, I'm going to also um, re be referencing why it's important for young people, the youth, to be shadowing developments around um, women and the, and, and, the, and the speed with which women have also progressed as far as uh, after is concerned. Some of the best practices that the youth can pick from women. The women and youth seem to be lumped together in the conversation on after, not because it's an easy thing to do, but because uh, for, for, for they, they, these are two demographics that can easily be sidelined when it comes to free trade areas. It's also important to understand that the, uh, after does not mean that everything has changed about the African Union, okay? Uh, what it says to us is that there's a lot more that we need to understand about the African Union. In the same way that the African peer review mechanism is celebrating 18 years of, 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 of its existence today for the great work that it has done, peer reviewing countries, um, and also, you know, even with the, the expansion of its mandate two years ago, where now the Africa peer review mechanism plays a greater role in peace and security, where it is predicting conflicts because it has a clearer picture of, uh, of data that is provided by member states on, on what is happening around the continent. Because of this, we realize that we need to learn a little bit more about the African Union. If we are not careful with the African continental free trade area, a lot of us may feel that it is a product of the private sector that has just dropped from the sky. This is wrong. The African continental free trade area, not to bore you, but it's important to get that background, started off not too long ago, in 2012. That's when the whole discussions around the boosting inter-African trade started. And then that led to the, it, at that time it was a continental free trade area. And then uh, later in 2015, when the, when SADC and COMESA and East Africa community came together under the tripartite free trade area, that gave vent to a lot of people that finally there could be an attempt at continental integration, but it was still three regional economic communities coming together. But I think that gave a lot of room for people to realize that, wow, if three regional economic communities can come together, then, then why don't we visit a larger continental union? And uh, the negotiators then decided that they really press ahead on, on working towards uh, the, the African continental free trade area. And here we are, 2018, it was signed in uh, Kigali, and here we are, finally, it has taken off. All of these has provided, all these opportunities, these spaces have provided room, room for the youth to uh, also engage. I remember that in different ways, I was, um, in different forums, I was at the um, AU's, uh, the regional youth consultation programs uh, that the, uh, Af uh, of the African governance architecture. I learned a lot there, which has informed some of my views on the, 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 the critical role that the youth needs to play uh, in the conversation on things like the African continental free trade area. A lot of you may have forgotten that in 2015, uh, at the same time that the tripartite free trade area was, uh, had taken place with SADC, Commerce and EAC, that was the same year that in West Africa, Burkina Faso, ordinary citizens led the crew in Burkina Faso. Now we had, uh, uh, we had one particular uh, young man in 2015, uh, you know, announced the crew on Twitter. This guy was called, uh, he's called Cyril Gell. He announced the, the coup on Twitter. He, he, he sent a message to the African governance architecture on Twitter. Uh, they picked it up and uh, he started unpacking really what was happening in, in, in Burkina Faso. Uh, and that was basically led by young people. Um, the, the whole uh, you know, movement around getting rid of Bless Compare, it was led by ordinary people, mostly young people, to ensure that they could have their say on, on, on what was right for them in, in, on, on, on the continent. Now, when we extrapolate that to what the African continental free trade area is able to do for, if ordinary young people were able to do that in 
uh, you know, getting rid of what they perceived as a dictator back six years ago in, in, in Bukina Faso, what is not possible under the African continental free trade area? I think now is the time it, 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 to be audacious, to be bold, uh, to think big about everything that you do. Now we're talking about scaling up. There's, you probably heard a lot of things about rules of origin, value addition, and all these things. When it comes to the African continental free trade, the thing that distinguishes it from other free trade areas is that they want to look at it as an African product. What is it that makes it African? And I think the most important takeaway from this is that there needs to be value addition in whatever you do. So whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you make shoes, whether you make leather bags, whether it's bicycle, bamboo bicycles that you're making, what is it that you will do differently than the next person so that you can scale it up for and sell it uh, in, in another country? So if you're in uh, South Africa, for example, you want to send it off to, uh, let's say Kenya, what is it that you are doing in South Africa that is different from Kenya and that you can add value to it so that Kenyans will be interested in uh, you know, uh, getting those imports from South Africa. These are the kind of things that the African continental free trade area offers. There are many technical areas around which there's not time to speak to and which there'll be other spaces to talk about. But the other thing is about the free movement uh, 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 protocol. Now, the young people are the ones, uh, or the youth demographic is the one that really benefits from uh, a free movement protocol. Now, I can already tell you that uh, some of us at, at our organizational level uh, are seeking to work actively, act actively working with organizations to make sure that we are popularizing the freedom of movement protocol, because there's not enough momentum around it in the way that there was on, 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 on after. At the end of the day, people can trade as effectively as they can move around the continent, which means therefore that if young people cannot move from one region to another, if they want to do business as AFTA speaks, uh, you know, is calling for them to do, then you may ask yourself, what is the point that I'm in this AFTA business? So I think one of the things that the young people can also pick up in whichever way, shape or form is to find out, to put pressure at the local level, national level, regional level, whichever level is possible, that freedom of movement, a critical part of the African continental free trade area, you know, needs to be, uh, uh, as many countries need to ratify it as possible. As we speak today, there are only four countries that have signed and ratified the free movement protocol. And yet there are 55 member states. 32 countries now have uh, signed have, ratif have ratified the African Continental Free Trade Area Protocol itself. Uh, 32, and yet free freedom of movement, only four? That's atrocious. There what it says, therefore, is that there are still member states that feel threatened by the fact that, you know, they need to open their borders. Now, if we're going to talk about Continental Free Trade Area, if we're going to trade, the borders need to be open. And who, who is in the position, which demographic is in the position to catalyze the change that needs to happen around this kind of op opening. It is the youth. Women are not going to do this. This, is, this can only be the youth that can do this. If youth can get rid of dictators in their countries, what can they not do around the African continent of free trade areas? So that's one of the takeaways that I'd like to leave with you. It's important right now to think big in whatever you do, be bold, be proactive, it, do, do not feel afraid to approach authority of the African Continental Free Trade Area Secretariat. They are as human as you and I. They may have the experience, they may have uh, certain skills and all these things that got them there, but they are the ones that are, who are going to make it work for you. So those are my takeaways, Leonard. Yes. A few highlights that I picked up from your lecture, Mr. Thank you. Emmanuel is the issue of the best practice, women being the best, best practice. Women in Africa since time memorial have been moving throughout the continent doing cross-border trading. So I think it's a best practice for us um, uh, young people who are involved in business to learn from the women of Africa. But with what you've said, there are a number of things that I'm thinking on top of my mind. With three quarters of African youth not connected to the internet, how do they participate in the free continental free trade agreement? With almost 600 million Africans in general not connected to electricity, power, issues of sanitation, how do they access education? 
with most of our education still colonized, not decolonized, how do we make sure that the continental free trade agreement actually benefits young African people? So I have two colleagues here who are going to respond to this lecture and give their own inputs. The first one is my brother Cyrus. He's from the land of a thousand hills in Rwanda, Kigali. Mr. Cyrus is the CEO of one of our partner institutions, Governance for Africa. They've helped us a lot in bringing this together. He's a Pan-African civil society um, um, champion and has been doing a lot of work um, over the past 10 years. Um, he helps uh, member states of the AU in bringing civil society organizations together. Uh, the overall agenda of Governance for Africa, the organization that he directs, is to realize Africa's vision, right? To make sure that there's cross-pollination in terms of uh, discussions around gender, discussions around political affiliation, region, regional um, 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 topics uh, around ethnicity. Um, and he has done a lot of work, so I want to ask Mr. Cyrus to come on board. Tell us a little bit of what he does and respond to this lecture. Thank you so much, Mr. Cyrus. You have the floor. Um, greetings, everyone. And um, thank you, Brother Lennon, comrades. Greetings from Governors for Africa and um, the country of a thousand hills and a millions of smiles. Um, which is Rwanda. Uh, my name is Cyrus Rusi. I'm uh, the CEO of uh, Governance for Africa. Governance for Africa, our vision is a democratic, peaceful, and empowered African society. And our um, main mission is to enhance and promote the principles of good governance and people's rights for sustainable development and prosperity. Uh, without going, uh, taking much time, is that uh, youth participation, first of all, uh, is not a favor, it's a right for the young people or for mankind in that age bracket. And uh, thank you so much, um, uh, uh, Mr. Emmanuel, I think as um, when, some, uh, when Lennon was introducing you, mentioned that we also worked with the civil society and uh, as governance for Africa, we are looking forward uh, to how can um, governance for Africa bring together civil society and also as a member of APRM civil society network, APRM youth network, we are looking at how can uh, young people or non-state actors also participate fully in the realization and implementation of SFTA at the continental retreat area because uh, ACDEG, which is the African Charter on Democracy, Elections and Governance, calls all African citizens to participate in all the affairs. Back to the topic, uh, I think I want to go back a little bit on and the mindset and what causes the mindset of uh, young people, most of them, what seems to be as a challenge, uh, challenges. One, I'll say the, the partition of Africa, which have really uh, gone into our mind for our young people that Africa in its current form is a creation of the Western powers who, divided us to serve their interests. This process is called the divide and rule. You, maybe someone may say that, um, why are we still blaming this? But in terms of mindset, we still think if we are talking about SFTA, how are we going to address the issue of intra-African trade? How are we going to address the issue of homegrown solutions? Yet when we still think that whatever is here, is nothing, whoever is uh, in Western world is doing well and actually the reverse is true. Then overcoming, this overcoming uh, the mindset change through 
uh, racism, miseducation, Africans have really mentally enslaved to believe that they cannot develop. And we have enough land, young people are there, but everyone we are fighting, one of our researches is that uh, we are fighting with uh, rural urban migration. And actually, the urban is very small. Most of them are not educated and they are leaving enough land and um, enough space to develop themselves. So these are some of the challenges we should be really discussing, the reality, not just maybe philosophy and other uh, notebooks or being as tourists. We need to talk to our young people and tell them the reality. Then unfair trade, current trade, the Western power, it's a real a pit and a shame if Rwanda can grow maize and export maize to Germany, yet the neighbor in Tanzania or Uganda is really lacking maize. And you find that very much uh, export will come in a form of a show for which young people are going to suffer paying that donation for a long period of time as we are keeping in poor. Then I'll say aid as a tool for, for control. Let me go to the objectives. I think I thought of sharing what should be young people doing to talk opportunities to match with Agenda 2063. And uh, I think the Agenda 2063, young people should work up and really uh, participate in implementation because most of the vision bearers as uh, we we saw in the in the in the shared video with uh, uh, his excellence Tabo Mbeki and others, some of our elders will not be there. But it says that um, need to work up and start implementing this at national level, uh, hence at the continental level. But this goes by the the willingness. Of, uh, of the governments. Uh, there I'm talking about the political will. From the political will, then it goes to the policies which are youth friendly. And if the have the policies which are youth friendly, then we have a third one, which is the institutions, like the desk where young people can go and ask whatever they want. And this, also the issue that uh, one of the other challenges that are there, our countries have really ratified and signed these protocols, uh, the charters of the AU. So signing and ratifying is one thing, but I always, um, our interventions as governors for Africa, implementation is more important than just ratifying and signing those documents and dump them uh, somewhere. So the objective uh, I want the young people who are following us on this um, uh, youth forum is that, um, first of all, to raise awareness, to teach the principles and values of Pan-Africanism in all institutions and sectors of our society and from the, to the, uh, from the grassroots. So that uh, civic education, norms and values, patriotism, because patriotism, this is being proud of who you are. It's not necessarily being a politician. So I think raising awareness on Pan-Africanism, remember whatever we are discussing about, this was, this is a kid of Pan-African movement. And this was a process from the, yes. Please wrap it up my brother, thank you so much. Okay, as I wrap up, so we need awareness, we need equipping the regular, uh, we need the advocacy, inspire to change. Lastly, lastly, who should be a good African youth? As I conclude, one, politically conscious, because this affects all of us. This goes to the policies, institutions, and politics. Number two, to be agents of development. This starts with us, not to be job seekers, but to create and give jobs our fellows. Then lastly, to be a responsible citizen is to understand 
the challenges, the opportunities around your area and your region, then you become an exemplary. Thank you so much. Thank you, my brother, Sarah, for giving us the, the, the key uh, sort of respondents to uh, Mr. Bensham. Key, uh, key things that you mentioned that I really liked there is us taking responsibility uh, of the free trade agreement. We, I don't think it's right for us to have 35 countries that have ratified and signed the CFTA and only have four countries that have uh, opened up their borders for free movement protocol. This is where the agency of youth needs to come in. We need to make noise so that our political actors come on board. They realize this is a timely opportunity for us young people to be able to travel throughout the continent, to be able to do business. And I want to take this opportunity to bring my brother Nolo. Mr. Nolo is an entrepreneur himself. He has done a lot of work. He's a serial, he calls himself a serial entrepreneur, a youth specialist with experience in startups and innovation. He pre he's previously an associate manager of Procter Gamble. He has worked at KPMG commodities sector. He's a board member of several sort of startups such as Dentex, Greenside Africa. And he's gonna tell us more about the role of entrepreneurs but colleagues, I see what's happening in the chat section. I need you to come into the chat section if you're a business person, connect. Tell us what you're doing in business and how you want the free continental trade agreement to help you. Connect with colleagues. I want to welcome colleagues that are coming from Kenya, Nairobi. I recognize you colleagues that are coming straight out of Nigeria, the giant of Africa. You're welcome. But right now, I'm calling in Mr. Nolo to give us um, his response. Thank you so much, Mr. Nolo. Thank you very much for, for being here. I know there's a light behind me. I hope that it doesn't bother you guys too much um, as we get into this key agenda. Uh, I'd like to start off by sending greetings to particularly the AU, the African Peer Review Mechanism. Uh, I'd like to send it to the Youth Bridge Trust, the uh, Ford Foundation, the Thurgood Marshall Scholarship, um, my fellow panelists, and, and most importantly, obviously, my fellow young Africans who are joining me on this call here. Um, I'd like to say it's actually uncanny that this is the inaugural African Youth Economic Forum when you consider the fact that African youth have always been at the center of the African development story. So I think it's only apt that this is happening. So shout out to the leadership. I am a young guy, so I'm going to use a lot of street language. Shout out to the leadership. I really appreciate it. A famous Scottish poet once said, now that the fight for the mountaintop is over, the battle for the plain has just begun. If there was ever a quote that encapsulates where Africa is, it is definitely this one. Because now that the fight for the mountaintop of youth participation or, or rather youth engagement or inclusion is over, the battle for youth participation is only beginning. I'd like to send a special um, shout out, as I said, to Professor Ezra, all the way from the US. Uh, this year marks the 401st year since that ship took our brothers and sisters uh, from the west coast of Africa across the Atlantic to the country where you reside right now. And I want to say as a young African, we look forward to the collaboration with our brothers and sisters across the other side of the ocean in helping rebuild the African story in this next century. Um, I'd, I'd also like to take a moment and send my condolences to our brothers and sisters all the young leaders from the nation of Tanzania, as you've lost an incredible leader, a father on the continent at this time. My prayers and hopes are with you. Now, I wanna get into this thing and, and, and really try to break it down from an economic point of view, because we need to talk about the practicalities of what development looks like in Africa. There's some overriding challenges we are all aware of, and I think it's only worthwhile for us to take a moment and deal with it. One of the key challenges we've had for a while now is that Africa is policy rich and implementation poor. So we're very good with formulation of strategies, but typically historically we've been largely incapacitated or at least minimally capacitated to execute on those things. And there's a number of reasons why this would be the fact, but the thing I want to focus on is that it's led to a reality where we have leaders in society who are focused on what I call political management as opposed to political leadership. We have people who say, what do I do now to get voted in five years from now 
as opposed to what do I do now that can help our nation a hundred years from now? And if I execute on that, that is how I get voted into power. Now, this is important because the political management versus political leadership mindset is what's going to frame my short talk as I zero in on the youth reality. What is the youth reality? Uh, apart from us having drip, apart from Bernard Boy and Wiz Kids, shout out for the Grammys, this is where young people are in Africa, right? Uh, the average president, the average president's age in this country is 72 years old. 72 years old. That's a conversation we can have. I'll be sensitive to the platform. 70% of youth, 70% uh, of the population in Africa is youth. That's people under the age of 35. This makes us the most youthful continent in the world. We have high youth unemployment rates. Uh, South Africa in particular, the country that I'm from, has one of the highest youth unemployment rates in the world. We have underdeveloped infrastructure, and this presents different challenges because our, educa our tertiary education system are not well funded, cannot cater for the numbers. Uh, education systems are an issue. Roads are an issue. Um, logistics is an issue. So, so there's all these challenges infrastructure-wise, which really underpins the lack of development. And then the last thing I really spoke about is a poor continental youth machinery. And that's a conversation we can have outside of that. Why I mentioned those five issues, and they're five out of 25, or how many you may pick. Some may focus on health care, some may focus on environmental and green issues, some people may focus on you know, pure economic, political policy, whatever your focus is. I just mentioned those five because I want to use them as the bricks as we build this reality, which is the main point of my talk, is how does the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement stimulate or help in breaking this youth crisis? Now, there's one thing I want to say which is important, is that this agreement is not a silver bullet. Young people, this agreement is not going to save us. In fact, no one is coming to save us. You and I need to roll up our sleeves, have strong vision, have a relentless commitment to implement, and begin to build our nations brick by brick, using this framework as favorable terms. But the reality is this framework alone is not going to save this nation. Now, why do I say this? The uniqueness of Africa is this, right? We don't have the benefit of an apolitical development agenda like other regions of the world. They take, you know, many regions like Asia or like nations like China, um, where, where essentially there's a large amount of people, a mass population, and there's an apolitical development agenda. There's a clear focus of what the nation looks like 100 years from now and how they reverse engineer that process. Here in Africa, it's very different, of course, for a whole lot of different reasons. Uh, we can talk about the history of the continent. We can talk about a whole lot of things. But the reality is we typically don't have that. And that creates a reality where everyone has a different development agenda, focusing on what's important in their nation. And typically, this has inhibited our participation in the broader region. And so this agreement is a beginning, but it's not the end. Yeah, it, it, it's the means to an end, it's not the end itself. The end itself is development of the continent. The other reason which, you know, we'll, we'll see us slow down a little bit is obviously post-COVID. So the average debt level of countries has, has, has risen from the average of 40% up to about 58, 59%. And I believe this will lead to local consolidation fiscally in the different countries. And depending where they are, the kind of revenues they can generate, this will determine their debt approach and largely the focus of the economies for the midterm. So this will again present challenges for us in terms of how we grow. So I'm going to focus on the three aspects of the agreement, which are critical, and how they apply to youth and how youth can leverage them. One, the free movement of people. This is a great idea, but the reality is, and I love the previous speaker, Cyrus had said, um, only, only four countries or six countries have ratified that agreement. Now, this is a challenge because it means that people agree conceptually, but not practically. So this is a huge challenge. The other one is the free capital of goods, right? We, we're trying to release capital in Africa so that it can develop us moving forward. This will present a unique opportunity that I believe young people should focus on, which is the challenge between DFIs, direct um, foreign investment, and how we leverage that in the context of this agreement. Why do I say that? For instance, how do we deal with a case where you've got an African mineral mined by a foreign company beneficiated in a foreign land? 
where the capabilities are not African, but the goods are. And in policy terms, they call that the source of goods, etc. But this is some of the thinking we need to be attacking. We need to apply our minds to, to say, how do we create financial frameworks, be it in fund formats, be it in, uh, in sovereign funds, but, but how do we create national and regional frameworks that can stimulate investment and, protect, protect, and give protection for our countries in this direct foreign investment landscape, particularly when it comes to capital goods and uh, really moving forward. This is important because this will really frame how we do things. The other thing is obviously the movement of goods, but there's huge challenges around this, around the tariffs. No one can agree uh, at the exit as well. The reality is the plan is that by 2025, we would have you know, developing countries zero rated by 2030, least developed countries zero rated. This is all a great idea, but the local implication is quite significant with the difference of tax systems, et cetera. So this is something that young people need to focus on. If I can give you a, a, a specific context as well, if you're talking about goods, everyone's talking about localizing, right? Let's localize all the things that are produced in the world, keep value in Africa, and I'm fully aligned with it. But there's practicalities young people need to focus on. Let's take, for instance, Ghana and the Ivory Coast. Cocoa. Everybody loves chocolate. I love chocolate. You love chocolate. Your mom loves chocolate. The Swiss loves chocolate. So chocolate is important in this world. Ghana, one of the largest producers of cocoa and the Ivory Coast, might I say, are going to have a very interesting conversation, which is if we localize, at which part do we localize, right? So say, for instance, Ghana chooses to stay in primary production, and the Ivory Coast say they've got upstream on the value chain, which means they'll do the ones with the processing, the packaging, etc. Well, the question then be, if Ivory Coast can grow its own cocoa, why do they need Ghana? If Ghana does the same, the question would it be, well, why won't the two joint forces and compete against each other? So there's practical regional dynamics, especially around minerals, that we have to consider. And I'm mentioning minerals for a very specific region. This is why we have to think about it. Now, I heard mention of the youth dividends, which is fantastic. Um, however, the, I, I've got an interesting viewpoint in that. The youth dividends, the way we talk about it, is based on potential. Yeah, this is not realized benefit. This is the potential of the youth dividends. This is important because unless we frame it that way, we will not have the relentless pursuit and focus to go out and do the work necessary to realize the potential this young population gives us as a continent. So there was a sixth study, in fact, there was a Six Nations study uh, done by the Brain Trust Foundation focusing on the uh, six fastest growing economies in South Africa, focusing largely on the linkage between the youth dividends and the economic growth. And the reality is the nations didn't necessarily grow any quicker or faster just because there's young people there. The dividends only works when you invest in education, you invest in training, there's capital to start businesses, the economy grows at a certain rate, the employment absorption rate is at a certain point, there's deeper capacitation in healthcare, and all these other linkages that are important to function for a developing nation. This is important or else we're going to find ourselves having a youth dividend tool shop as opposed to youth dividend strategies that can maximize this young population we have on the continent. Now, I will close with these two points, that in order for us to truly understand this, we need to take a political leadership approach as opposed to management. The clearer context is what's necessary. Everyone talks about the fourth industrial revolution, and while this is brilliant, Africa has to admit that we are not quite where the rest of the world is in terms of infrastructure, connectivity, mobile penetration, and just reliance on everyday technology and communications to exist in the world we live in. This, I believe, gives Africa a unique edge to compete globally. This means if we realign our focus and realize that for us, the fourth industrial revolution is not about cell phones, but about the minerals that make the cell phones, I believe will give ourselves a 20, 30 year period of accelerated growth and development. If we understand that the lithium reserves, 90% of them, that are necessary for batteries in mobile, batteries in laptops, batteries in mobile vehicle uh, batteries is, is coming out of Africa, we can begin to realign and refocus how we train our young people, how our education systems function, and by and large, how the economy is geared, and use it as a catalyst. This doesn't mean that Africa is going to be a continent of mining, but it is a leverage of a resource that can help us move forward into the next thing. I focus on three practical things. One I've just mentioned about that. The other one is as Africa grows, there's going to be a high penetration of vehicles, yet we don't produce any car batteries. 
we don't produce any cylinders, we don't have production capability that is ours for the very cars that we will drive. This is a massive opportunity. Tire manufacturing, massive opportunity. Just think about anything involving a vehicle and localizing that for the region. And because we can trade amongst each other, we can specialize forth and focus on these things. Roads, infrastructure development is going to be a huge thing in Africa. Uh, the average highway costs $1 million per one kilometer. Think of how many kilometers need to be built in Africa and then take that number and multiply it by $1 million. How do we keep that value in South Africa? How do we make sure that we're not just using Dumbote cement, but we're using other local producers for aggregate, we're using local engineers, and more importantly, we're using people who understand our people and our context to build these things. Uh, let's take the third thing as well, packaging. Just active packaging, just a box for your goods. You know when you order something from Amazon, it comes in a box? Up until five years ago, Africa didn't have a degree course on packaging. The rest of the world did. We only have diplomas at the moment. In fact, the only university which I'm aware of that offers that is in South Africa, and it's funded by one of the biggest packages in the world, which means they're just building pipelines for themselves in terms of talent and aren't really moving forward. But I'm going, the next time I order something off Amazon or wherever, why can't it be a local African youth entrepreneur who made the box and I know is creating employment and we're keeping the money here in Africa? These are practical things we can talk about. We can talk about zips. We can talk about laces in South Africa up until Mr. last year. Mr. Nolo, thank you so much. You have one minute to wrap it up. You are doing very well. People are loving this. But in one minute, how can you summarize this um, for the interest of time, please, sir? Oh, fantastic. Lennon, you sound like my mom. She always shuts me down like that, so I'm a bit hurt, man. But uh, on a serious note, my conclusion would be this. Africa is rising, but who is it rising for? And this is the biggest question we need to ask ourselves. The second question we need to ask ourselves is, what does a continent look like that is rising? I'll tell you. Economic activity, job creation, infrastructure development, shifting political thinking, but most importantly, all of this is underpinned by youth involvement because youth are critical. When we talk about nation building, we talk about something that's youth centric in nature, because the question is who are you building the nation for and who are you building it with? So my conclusion would be, this is not a silver bullet. This is just a framework. This is just a shirt that allows us to get on the field and play the game. Young people, let's focus on playing the game and not warming the bench like we have for the past 60 years. Thank you very much. I, I again apologize for cutting you short, um, teacher. I'm going to call you teacher Nolo because what you have said there are words of wisdom. And what I really like about your presentation is that you have given us actionable things to do as African young people. You have even given member states of the AU what to do. I like the fact that um, the Republic of Ghana has now decided to stop sending uh, cocoa beans out. So Africans be prepared to eat African chocolate we must be prepared to eat African chocolate. This is how we move the CFTA. Um, but before we move on to the next session, I want to rem uh, remind your colleagues to use our chat sections to tell us what you do, your businesses, so that we can connect. But I also want to recognize um, uh, some of our participants. We've got Comrade Tato from Free State South Africa. We've got Sianda in cryptocurrency. We've got Sebastian in Kenya. Sbongile uh, Gama, we have got uh, brother Valerie Washa in telecommunications in Kenya. Colleagues continue, continue pushing the economic freedom of our people on the continent. The next session colleagues is going to be even better than the previous sections. So I'm going to call in my brother Seth to um, usher in the next and final session. Thank you so much colleagues. <music>
Uh, but as, as of right now, I know it's lunchtime in some areas and it's lunchtime here in South Africa. We're gonna give a five minute lunch break. It's not the long lunch break, a very quick lunch break, just, just for you to get a drink, get a stretch, uh, quickly run to the bathroom, quickly answer that email, send that text message, then we'll come back. But just to throw forward, we're having the next session, uh, which is going to focus on pan-Africanism, African integration, and the Africa Free Trade Agreement, and free movement of people protocol hosted by Breaking Down Borders Africa. So that's going to come straight after the break. So please enjoy the break. Keep tweeting. The hashtag is APRM Day, A Y E. AYEF forum. Uh, so keep sending those tweets through. We're retweeting and also share the live stream for Agenda 2063 TV, but we're also live on Facebook as well. So enjoy your five minute break and we'll see you in a moment. Thank you. from mostly preventable reasons, preventable causes, went from 5.8 down to 3.9. We believe that young people have the power to change the world. We don't believe that they are passive recipients of development. We believe that young people should be active drivers of change. Founded in the values around social justice and we're working to really understand and alleviate issues of inequality. And so as Youth Bridge Trust, we've chosen to focus on building Africa's future, which we believe is found in its young people. Hi, my name is Seth Mooney. I'm the Executive Director of the Youth Bridge Trust. Our vision is to build Africa's future, and today we launched our organization to the public. Our goal is to really fund youth organizations in Africa, build the capacity of youth organizations, and through our knowledge hub, share thought leadership, training on the future of work. So if that's what you are about, head over to our website at www.youthbridgetrust.org to find out more and partner with us in building Africa's future. Cabello and Bonang want to make red pens and hand cramps a thing of the past with their Breakthrough Marking app. It would help educators spend less time grading papers and more time teaching. We try by all means to close the gap in empowering learners, but no one speaks about empowering teachers. You know most of the teachers in the ground are very old, so they are resistant to new ideas. They might not be willing to use this new idea. So we want to be able to enable teachers to use technology effectively in class for them to be able to do administration work so that they can focus their time teaching in class and giving them as quality education because we realized during our research that actually teachers spend teaching time marking formal assessments because they want to be able to have the administration. But at the end of the day, learners get affected because they lose the essential time for them to receive quality education. 